السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مذل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد So today inshallah we'll move to the next hadith which is a hadith, a hadith number 112 and that comes under the chapter heading of Imam al-Bukhari's Adab al-Mufrad under the chapter heading that one should not take his fill of food without seeing to his neighbor meaning that a person whilst knowing that his neighbor is hungry then he should not fill his own stomach whilst he knows that his neighbor is hungry so this is the chapter heading Imam al-Bukhari then mentions his chain of narration that Muhammad bin Kathir narrated to us who said that Sufyan informed us from Abdul Malik bin Abi Bashir from Abdullah ibn al-Musawir who said that I heard ibn Abbas that I heard ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma telling Az-Zubair that he said or that he, that he was telling Zubair that he heard the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam saying a true believer is not the one who takes his fill of food while his neighbor is hungry and the chain of narration it is sahih again that a true believer is not one who takes his fill of food while his neighbor is hungry so from this hadith we understand that it is a deficiency in a believer that his iman is not complete and perfect while he knows that his neighbor is hungry so that is a deficiency in his iman that he sits and eats and he knows that there are people next door to him or the door after that that are going hungry i.e. why doesn't he have concern for them just as he enjoys his food then why do they not have the right of food so it is important that a believer that he pays attention my brothers and sisters to his surroundings pay attention to those who you pray with in the masjid Pay attention to your neighbor and their children, whether they're suffering, whether they are suffering in terms of food and drink and clothing, whilst you yourselves, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you ease. That ease that Allah has given you is a test for you to see how you'll behave and how you'll react and how you'll how you will thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the bounties that he has bestowed upon you and from the ways of thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is by giving that which Allah has provided for you giving the wealth that Allah has given you a share of that to others as sadaqah that the a person barakallahu feekum a person who has iman that is complete then that is a person who calls upon those who are in need so a sign of a perfection of Iman is that a person pays attention and he looks towards those who are in need and he tries to fulfill their need it should never be the case that a person who has food and drink that he denies his neighbor 
who has nothing to eat and nothing to drink and nothing to feed his family with. This is not in agreement with the akhlaq of a Muslim, with the conduct and behavior and manners of a believer. Because the believers, they always strive to perfect Iman in terms of their deeds, in terms of their actions, in terms of their love, in terms of their fear, in terms of their hope, in terms of their knowledge. All of these increase Iman and perfect Iman. So by performing these outward deeds and by showing concern for others, the Iman is perfected. For this reason, the Prophet wasallam, that he negated the perfection of Iman in this hadith for the one who takes his fill that he is satiated by the food that he eats and the and the drinks that he takes that he himself that he takes his fill whilst he knows that his neighbor is hungry and he knows that his neighbor is not able so the mu'min who has achieved the perfection of Iman or he strives to achieve perfection of Iman is the one who shows good treatment to his neighbor to the, to the amount that he is able to do and especially if his neighbor just like his relatives that we mentioned previously in the previous ahadith especially those who are in need of that which is necessitated for them such as food and drink and knowledge of Tawheed and so on from those affairs and necessities that are a must that a human has you don't walk past a person who is dying from thirst and you don't give him to drink even if, if, even if that was a dog you wouldn't walk past a dog and not give him water whilst his tongue is lulling and he's close to death because of thirst. So if you're not allowed to do that with a dog or a cat or a creature other than the humans, then how can we do it to our neighbors or our relatives and our brothers, our sisters, our cousins, our uncles, aunts, or to any believer or even an unbeliever? These are from the affairs that show a deficiency in a person's iman that he walks past such people and he does not help them so a person should should not allow his neighbors to go hungry whilst he fills his own belly the next hadith is a hadith number 113 that comes under the chapter heading which and the chapter heading is that water should be added to broth so it can be shared with the neighbors. So this is Babu Yukthir Ma al Marak Fayaksimu Fil Jiran. So it is about the affair of increasing the quantity of soup or broth. With the intention of what? That you will take from it and that you will give some to your neighbor. So a person increases the amount that they are cooking with the intention of sharing it. Imam al-Bukhari mentions his chain of narration. He said that Bishr bin Muhammad narrated to us. And he said that Abdullah informed us. And he said that Shu'ba informed us. From Abi Imran al-Jawni. From Abdullah bin Samit from Abu Dhar radiyallahu anhu the companion who said Awsani Khalili Bithalath he said that my best friend or my good friend advise me with three matters who is the good friend of Abu Dhar who is his Khalil he said Awsani Khalili the friend of Abu Dhar is none other than Abu Qasim Muhammad bin Abdullah, meaning the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the Messenger of Allah advised Abu Dhar with three. 
he said to him hear and obey the ruler even if he is a slave whose limbs have been mutilated and amputated then he said and if you are going to make some broth then add water to it then look to the houses of your neighbors and pour some out for them for goodness meaning to do good for them and to treat them well then he said and this is the third matter and pray the prayer on its time so if you find when you have reached the messenger that the imam has already that, that the imam has prayed and then you have already prayed at home and fulfilled it and if the imam has not prayed then join him in prayer as a nafal for you and this hadith it is sahih and the final point of course that third point is that you pray the prayer at its proper time meaning that if you end up praying and you have prayed at home at its proper time and then you go to the masjid and you find that the imam has already prayed then alhamdulillah you have already prayed also but if you find that the imam has not prayed then join him even though you have already prayed in that case your prayer will be a nafal prayer meaning it will be an optional prayer for which you are rewarded with the intention of nafal this hadith is a proof and an evidence that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that he would advise and enjoin upon his companions pieces of advice that were wise and merciful and he would advise them in various affairs and you can see in this one hadith three matters from the various parts of a person's life and various aspects of a person's life so he would advise them sallallahu alayhi wasallam in accordance to their condition and from those advices and pieces of advice is this precious advice that he gave to his companion Abu Dhar regarding three affairs and three actions of piety for which a person is rewarded with the best in this world and the best in the hereafter as for the first piece of advice then that is to obey to hear and obey the ruler even if the ruler who has been appointed over you is a slave who has mutilated and amputated limbs meaning that you are looking at your ruler and you see that you are maybe repulsed by him then the Prophet Sallallahu is saying don't be repulsed hear him and obey him because he has been appointed whether you like it or whether you dislike it whether you like how he looks or you dislike how he looks it does not matter even if he is a slave it doesn't matter even if he is a Abyssinian slave from Ethiopia with limbs that have been mutilated and amputated it is obligatory for you to obey him in that which is good in that which is in accordance with the Sharia and that which does not oppose the command of Allah just as the Prophet Sallallahu said that indeed obedience is in that which is correct or that which is good so so long as your ruler is either the overall ruler of the Muslims meaning of your land so if he is the overall ruler of your land ruler of your land then you obey him and even if he is someone who is appointed someone more particular and specific then you obey him and it is obligatory upon you to remain as such 
and it is forbidden for you and prohibited for you to rebel against the Muslim ruler. Rather, you must fulfill the right that is deserving of his pledge of allegiance and to cooperate with him in the affairs of the nation and dunya and deen. And through that, security will be achieved in the land and for the people. And goodness will spread and evil will diminish, inshallah. As for rebelling against the Muslim ruler, then all of it is evil. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he warned against it and he prohibited, prohibited it with the severest of prohibitions. Even if you see in your ruler that which displeases you, that which you see as difficult deficiency, or that he oppresses his population, or that he imprisons some of them and transgresses against some of them, then it is still not permissible for anyone to rebel and revolt against the ruler or to behave towards him in an evil manner or to spread defamatory speech concerning him in, in within your society or within among the people whether they are within that country or even outside of that country it is not allowed for that opposes the manhaj of ahlu sunnati wal jama'ah the methodology of ahlu sunnah and the methodology of the salaf and the sahaba Rather, the methodology and the belief of Ahlul Sunnah and the people of Hadith is to hear and obey the ruler in that which is good and correct, meaning in accordance to the Sharia, and to have sabr, to have patience. If anything emanates from him and comes from him, that is a deficiency, or that you see in him oppression, that he is an oppressor then it is still obligatory upon you to be patient and not revolt or rebel. And that is due to the greater benefit that is attained and to avoid bloodshed and chaos and destruction and disorder within societies and especially within Muslim societies such that we become weakened and then therefore we become targets of the, of the enemies of Islam. Naam. And this is also that which Allah has enjoined upon us and that which the Messenger of enjo has enjoined upon us through various hadith and ayat. Just as Allah has said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu a'tiyu Allah wa a'tiyu rasul wa ulil amri minkum. O you who believe, obey Allah and obey his Messenger and those in authority over you, meaning the rulers. So therefore it is obligatory to obey them and it is impermissible and haram to revolt against them and to disobey them as for the second point that was mentioned to Abu Dhar by his friend Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that is showing good treatment towards the neighbor by way of giving them gifts and pleasant offerings that which you are able to do for your neighbor from food and drink or anything that will benefit them that which will comfort the soul of your neighbor and to fulfill their needs and, there, and thereby you are rewarded the one who does so then that is the neighbor that is rewarded even if he does not reciprocate hadith doesn't mention so long as he gives you some soup back or so long as he sends you some biscuits or cakes. Hadith doesn't mention that. Hadith just mentions, just mentions what you should do. And the Sahaba, they used to do that. They used to tell their wives and their families and their servants, add some more water. Add some more water to the maraq, to, uh, to the soup. Increase the quantity that you are making and send it to the neighbor. The Sahaba used to do this and the Salaf used to do this. Maybe tonight 
Before you break your fast, you can send some fruit over, even if it is two apples. Even if it is some grapes. Even if it is some bread. With some olive oil and olives. Anything. Sending something over. Then there is huge reward. And in fact, the family member should compete in deciding what small thing to send to your relatives or to your neighbours. Maybe today to the nearest neighbour, then tomorrow to the neighbour after that. Then maybe a cousin of yours or an uncle of yours. Sending something to them. And we all fall short in this regard. All of us, myself included. But that doesn't mean that we don't remind each other for indeed the reminder benefits. The third advice that the Prophet ﷺ gave and that he enjoined upon Abu Dhar is to establish the prayer in its time. Jum'ah, which is the Friday prayer. The Jama'ah, which are the congregational prayers on a daily basis. That they should be established in the houses of Allah. Houses that are, of course we refer to them as masajid, but they are biyut, min biyutillah. They are houses from the houses of Allah, where Allah is worshipped. Houses that are free from shirk and bid'ah. Meaning that you should pray in the masajid of Ahlul Sunnah and Salafiyyah with the people of Tawheed. And the Salah is the Ummul Ibadat Al Amaliyya. It is the mother of all of the acts of worship. The outward actions of worship. The best of them that you do upon your limbs is the Salah. It is the mother of them and the essence of them. And it is the supporting pillar of Islam. It is the second pillar after the Shahadatain. And anyone who is lazy and lackadaisical and doesn't care about that, then they are destroyed and they are in disgrace. And they should humble themselves in, hum and, and in, in humility before Allah. And not consider the prayer to be nothing. They consider it to be one of the things that you do in the day. And many people they avoid it or they miss it or they're late with it. Or they don't concentrate with it or they don't make the wudu for it correctly. And they don't, and they don't focus upon it. And they don't realize that after entering into Islam, the next important thing is the prayer and its establishment. It is the illuminating light of this world, the prayer. And in the barzakh, and in the hereafter, for the one who established it. It is for this reason that buildings are built for it. Do you know of any other place for which a building is built from the acts of ibadah that the Prophet ﷺ built other than the prayer? For this pillar alone, Hundreds and thousands of buildings across the world are built to establish this pillar of the of the of Islam. So for the one who is able to go to the mosque, then it is not permissible for him to pray at home. And of course this applies to the men, not to the women. For the women the best place for them to pray is in the house. So it is not permissible for the one who is able and he hears the adhan. For him now not to go to the masjid. Haram. Major sin. If you can hear the adhan in his house. From the local masjid. So long as it is not a masjid of shirk. And kufr. Where al other than Allah is worshipped. If it is a masjid of sunnah. And tawheed. It is not permissible for you. To avoid praying there. And it is not permissible. Therefore for you to pray in your houses whilst you hear the adhan from the masjid or to pray in the marketplaces or uh, or in your gardens and your farms rather the salah is for the masjid and that's why the masajid were built for sajda to be made therein and the prayer and it is and there and no one has an excuse except for the one who is excused due to the due to a sharia excuse 
such as he is sick or upon a journey and so on. And if you and if you miss the prayer in Jama'ah on an occasion, and then you enter the masjid and they have already prayed, and you feel regret for missing the prayer in, in the first Jama'ah, then Allah will write down for you that you actually prayed in Jama'ah because that's what you strived to catch. As for the one or if you don't care and you couldn't care less whether you caught the Jama'ah or don't, don't catch the Jama'ah, then your jaza, your recompense is in accordance to that which you intend and that which you do. So these three affairs that the Prophet ﷺ advised and enjoined upon Abu Dhar, then it is a must upon the Muslim that he learns them and that he acts upon them just as the text itself mentions and just how Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu narrated to his students and generation after generation it has reached 1400 years later to your ears that you have heard this wasiya of Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to Abu Dhar regarding the ruler regarding your neighbor and regarding your prayer wa jazakumullahu khairan walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh